All right, so for the last couple of weeks, what we've been doing is looking in depth at the last two chapters of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, the first letter. And we're looking at the last words of that letter, and that letter was actually the first letter that Paul wrote. So it's the earliest Christian writing that we actually have. Paul wrote it around 50 CE, and he wrote it to encourage this young congregation, this fellowship group in Thessalonica that he had visited, established, but wasn't able to return to for several years. And so in the bulletin is the actual text. I want you to follow along with me. I'm going to read it and offer some comments on different parts of it. So the first two verses, verses 12 to 13 of chapter 5, Paul writes, But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and who have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work and be at peace among yourselves. All right, pause. It's only been 20 years since Jesus' death and resurrection. So many of the apostles, the people who saw Jesus during his own lifetime, Many of them are still alive and traveling around preaching and teaching. In 50 CE, there is very little formal structure to the Christian church. There are mostly fellowship gatherings in homes who would come together to remember the life and teachings of Christ, to share communion, and to pray together. At this point, there are no New Testament scriptures. There are no gospels that are written. And there are, in many ways, no official preachers or church officers. But in each of these communities, there are house group leaders and people that the fellowship could turn to for a counsel or advice or inspiration. So in these verses, what Paul is doing is encouraging the young fellowship in Thessalonica to respect whoever is leading their fellowship and support them in love. All right, the next two verses, 14 and 15. We urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Now, I'll flesh out these verses a bit later, but basically Paul is saying, as a community, you need to work together. Now, some in that community were quite sure that Jesus was coming very soon, and therefore the basic rules and habits of daily life didn't apply to them anymore. Others were stumbling under the persecution that they were facing by being kicked out of the synagogues or being persecuted within the Greek cities. So Paul's hope is that they would all continue to be faithful and just, not persecuting and harming any others, but doing good and supporting one another at all times. Verses 16 to 22, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Now, again, Paul is just offering words of encouragement. Be strong in your faith. Rejoice, pray, even if you're facing times of persecution. At the same time, in these fellowships, there were people who felt led to offer words of prophetic wisdom, whether speaking in tongues or claiming special knowledge from God. But Paul is offering a measure of what I would call Presbyterian restraint. He's reminding them to test everything, to be guided by the larger witness of faith and not to succumb to false spirits or opportunistic prophecies. This comes up again in the later writings of the New Testament. In 1 John, we have the verse that says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. All right, and then the last verses, 23 to 28, Paul says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Now, Paul is returning to the theme of sanctification. That's where he started in chapter 4, this idea of growing stronger in body, soul, and spirit as you await Christ's return. 
Then he says, Beloved, pray for us. Now, the us is a reference to Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They had been there informing the church. They were now pretty much, we think, in Corinth, starting up the congregation that Paul would later write his letters to the Corinthians to. Paul says, Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So last comment. Paul commands that this very letter be read aloud to the whole house group, to the fellowship. And so from this one line, it's the only time he does this, but we see this is how the New Testament actually came to be. That they saved these letters of Paul and Peter and John. They collected them, copied them, and then added them to the Gospels, studying on them as a group. The practice marked Paul's missionary career, that he would write and expect the letters to be read to all, but it's the foundation of the New Testament that we have today. And it's a reminder that God's word is not just for individuals to take and choose. It was always intended for a community to read and reflect on and grow in faith together. Thessalonica in 50 CE and Pittsburgh today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Loving God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I know nothing about Paul's stationery. I realized that I, I had no idea about the nature of the paper that Paul used when he wrote to his various churches, like the little church in Thessalonica. And so I did some research on the topic. Most letters in the Greco-Roman period were short letters, maybe 150 to 200 words, and they would usually fit on one sheet of papyrus, usually about similar to a, a notebook uh, in paper that we use today. Now Paul, being a little more verbose, would need more than one page of paper. His shortest letter was 335 words, the letter to Philemon. His longest letter to the church in Rome was over 7,000 words. Now I mention this because when we get to the end of 1 Thessalonians, it feels like Paul is running out of room on his paper. His sentences become shorter and shorter. He exhorts rather than explains. He uses imperatives rather than full instructions. But the point is, even if Paul was running out of room on his papyrus, he saved the very best for last. In 1 Thessalonians, what Paul is doing is expressing his love and gratitude to this faithful small fellowship. He's telling them, keep doing the good work that I know you've been doing while you look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and the healing of the world. He knows very well this is a young church. He knows they're learning how to balance being led by the Holy Spirit and how to be an actual institution in that community of Christ's gospel. They're learning how to preach and teach and how to be an actual church, meeting for regular times of fellowship, worship, and prayer. And it's that tension that we see reflected in the end of Paul's letter. And so with any group and group dynamics, Paul begins by saying, be at peace with one another. Now that actually sounds kind of general, so Paul fleshes this out in the next verse. He says, I want you to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. The word for idlers is actually a funny word. It's the only time it really appears in the New Testament. And it doesn't really mean someone that's a lazy bones. The Greek word actually means someone who's disruptive or perhaps a little bit disorderly. Think of a marching band. The idlers are the ones who are constantly marching out of step, who keep veering off course and throwing off the others in the band. Every organization, dare I say, every church has a few people who march to a different drummer. 
who make it hard for everyone sometimes to stay on the parade route. But continue this same analogy. If there are idlers disrupting the flow of the band, then there's also the faint-hearted in the group, the shy flute player who keeps their heads down, plays too soft, never fully joins in with the group. And there's also in the group the weak, the skinny kid in the back who's struggling under the weight of the bass drum. So we have the disruptors, the faint-hearted, and the weak. Paul doesn't want us to kick any of them out of the band. He literally says, be patient with all of them. Always seek to do good. So the image here is not of a strict drum major enforcing the rules, but rather inviting us to be that one who stays behind after band practice to make sure that everyone knows their part. It's calling us to be that person who helps someone balance on the bicycle when they're learning how to ride without training wheels, or to be the friend that can be called when someone else is struggling with addiction and facing a moment of weakness, or to be the one who encourages someone else to get out of an abusive relationship, or to be the one who helps a friend sort through clothes or downsize a house after a beloved partner has died. To be patient with all of them, though, could easily sound like superficial advice, and it's not. To do this well requires real commitment and spiritual strength. For us as a nation, it requires that we admit that our myths about America are not always true. That we are not a mixture of people, races, and ethnicities that have all merged into one big family. As Daniel Moynihan said almost 60 years ago, the melting pot did not happen. See, we may move around this country and we may share a common language of fast food restaurants and sports team rivalries and other cultural manners. But as critical race theory actually correctly points out, we have all been shaped by our past, a past that includes institutional and individual racism, a past that has had anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-Native American policies. And it's a past that has followed us into the present day, and it still shapes our common life together. And so that's why Paul's words are so important, because they are both therapeutic, be patient with all, and they're transformative. Admonish, encourage, help the weak, faint-hearted, the idlers, the disruptors, who are there in your midst because they're part of my family. And why are we supposed to do this therapeutic, transformative faith? Because that's precisely the way God has treated us, and for all the same reasons. Now, the next little batch of verses focus on goodness and gratitude. And this is where Paul squeezes in a bunch of imperatives. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Always give thanks in every circumstance. We're all still navigating this long pandemic season. But Paul is calling us to be of good cheer in all situations, even this one. A pastor recently wrote that she and her husband had hung a map of the world on the kitchen wall. And they told themselves, let's throw a dart at that map. And when it's finally safe to travel again, we're going to go and vacation wherever that dart lands. She was happy to report that they'll soon be spending two weeks behind the refrigerator. <laughs> now, we need to face it. We can either spend all of our energy bemoaning the disruption caused by the coronavirus, or we can set aside time to reflect on what we've learned over this past year and a half and include the many good things that have emerged. Yes, there have been losses. Yes, there has been real trauma. But we are not defined by them. We are defined by our identity in Christ Jesus, who weeps with us, who laughs with us, who abides constantly with us. That's why near the end of the letter to the church in Philippi, similar to what Paul writes here to Thessalonica, 
He puts this in these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, this is not something superficial. This is not a don't worry, be happy Christian bumper sticker. It's like what the author Marilyn Robinson has called a posture of grace. When we're faced with trials, we shouldn't just shut down. We shouldn't just become angry at the bad luck that's befallen us and close ourselves off. Rather, we're called to come humbly before God and to do it with a grateful heart for God's many blessings over the years. And then out of that posture, that posture of grace and humility and gratitude, then we look at what's troubling us. Then we look at what's broken in our world and our relationships. And out of that posture, we discover what comes next, what God's Spirit is calling us to do, how we're to repay no one evil for evil, how we're to hold fast to what is good. We combine a posture of grace with an attitude of gratitude. And in that is peace and comfort and abiding faith. Now, once Paul had written all these admonitions, written down all these instructions and imperatives, he finally slips in his best word of encouragement. And I hope it's something that you'll remember even for the rest of today. I was reminded of this phrase when I read how the well-known British theologian N.T. Wright wrote in one of his books that there was a day when he was ordained to the ministry, and on that day he received many cards and telegrams and well wishes from people recognizing that special event. But one card stood out, and it came from a person that wrote a few words and then included just three small Greek words. Pistos ho kalon. The one who calls you is faithful. Now, that's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. And it's a reminder to us as individuals and as a church that Paul was sharing this word of hope with an entire community in Thessalonica. He has told them explicitly, read the letter aloud, chew on it together, open source its wisdom, grow in knowledge as you face challenges that day. But as you do so, hold on to that basic promise that the one who calls you, the one who calls you together, who planted the mustard seed of faith in your hearts, the one who nurtured that holy discomfort as you grapple with racism and injustice and the world's problems, the one who whispered to you in the morning in that still small voice that you're a beloved child of a loving God, that one who calls us is faithful. In another letter, Paul said the same thing. The one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Pistos ho kalon. Faithful is the one who calls you. It's that idea which is actually the true appeal of faith. And I mean that in both senses of the word. Paul offers an appeal, an exhortation, like at the beginning of this whole section when he said, respect those who labor among you, care for the members of the marching band as it were, be at peace, encourage, admonish as best you can. But his deeper message is to remind us that by living in this way, we discover the wonderful appeal of faith, the attraction that draws us to this gospel as a message of hope, of living water and life-giving bread. This is not the appeal of social media with the Facebook fiction that tells us that by liking a certain post, that has a direct cause and effect bringing about positive change. Because it's just not true. At most, liking a post is nodding in agreement when your friends say something that you like. But in and of itself, it changes nothing. 
No sin is removed. No injustice is solved. But if we accept instead the appeal of the Gospel, we become part of something bigger that does correct sin, that does challenge injustice, that does offer peace in a world besotted with guns and violence and division. It's an appeal that's grounded on that belief from the end of this letter. The one who calls us, the one who brings us together, is faithful, steadfast. We're called to trust in Christ, the Lord of the church, the mother of the global family, the Savior who intercedes for us individually and collectively. And no matter how much room Paul had on the end of his papyrus sheet, at that point, he knew he had to end with that message of hope. Let it be ours as well. You are called... And the one who calls you is faithful. Thanks be to God. Amen.